Okay, so well, thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's it's always a, a pleasure to be at Palomar, even if it's uh, virtually. <laughs> so uh, yeah, my name is Nadia Blagarodnova, and I'm a former Caltech postdoc, but currently I, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Netherlands at the University of Radboud in Nijmegen, which is the oldest city uh, in the Netherlands founded by the Romans, actually. So uh, yeah, if you have a bit of trouble remembering my surname, just think about um, Red Nova, which is something that I'm gonna talk about today. So Blago Red Nova, right? It's like nearly the subject I'm passionate about. So yes, I would like to start my presentation with, with a question and is um, how well do we actually understand how stars evolve when they have a companion? The recent detection of gravitational wave actually triggered the whole renaissance of the uh, stellar astronomy, trying to explain how those black holes and neutron stars formed and how they shrunk so much. So gravitational waves were important for the final merger. So these studies have been run mostly on the theoretical grounds, but what I'm interested in is how observation can actually help us to understand this phase. And here is where the stellar mergers and luminous red novae come from. So generally, when we think about stars and the universe is made of stars, we think about the sun. And yeah, in this uh, beautiful image, we see our, our sun, which is a single star. So we tend to think that the universe is made of single stars. And that was kind of the, um, the way to, to go forward in modeling the universe for many years. But recent studies actually show that this kind of landscape is, is very much more likely for stars, which are especially more massive. So in this, uh, in this study, they show that uh, for different masses of the primary star, which is the more massive star in a stellar couple, what is the fraction of, of the stars that actually have a companion? And we see that for one solar mass, so where this, uh, uh, our sun is, about roughly 20% of those stars actually have a companion, which is not that much. So the sun is, is okay. But if we go for larger masses, almost all of those stars have a companion. So actually binaries become more and more common, the more massive stars we are looking at. Up to the point that for the most massive stars, the fraction goes beyond one, meaning that those stars are actually not even in binaries, but they're in triples or quadruple systems. So the most massive stars really like to, to cluster together and like they're born already in a binary couple. So then, well, binaries, we should really take them into account when we study the universe. But not they are common, but also binaries, they, they do interact. So if we imagine a galaxy where stars are formed at a steady pace, what would be the picture of those stars in relation to their companions? So we see that only 22% of those stars would be actually single, only 22%. About 50% of them would be low mass stars that were born with a companion, but they still don't know about the companion. So they are still kind of evolving as if they were single. So they are called the free mass transfer phase. But already 28% of those are in this phase, which is called post mass transfer, or they are products of binary interaction. Some of them are these semi-detached systems when one of the companion is actively transferring mass to its lower mass companion. About 17% just finished uh, this mass transfer. So you have like uh, the stripped uh, star and the companion, which is the mass gainer, which had part of this mass. And about 8% are actually mergers. So during this uh, mass transfer, they, they actually uh, became one single star. So this is very interesting because what we saw for many years is this kind of picture. So we see a population of binaries, which are younger binaries, which are born with very large uh, kind of periods of like several years. And then we see um, uh, very compact binaries such as this one, uh, V471 tau, 
which is has a period of uh, a bit more than 12 hours and it's a main sequence star with a carbon oxygen white dwarf so this is a super compact uh, binary that was likely born with a 10 year period but then what we are interested in knowing is like how the binary went from this point a to point b and this is an interesting question because this uh, blue star the, the primary star when it would have evolved into like a, a red giant for example, its radius would lie well beyond where its companion is. So it would have kind of engulfed its companions when it would be uh, growing into becoming a, a red giant. So this was a problem that was already postulated by, by Paczynski in 1976. He wrote this um, very famous article called Common Envelope Binaries where he suggests when, this, when the binary expands so much that the stellar surface moves beyond this outer Lagrange point, which we will see later, a common envelope binary form. This suggestion is made while the two dense stellar nuclei spiral towards each other, the envelope expands and it's eventually lost. So most of the angular momentum is lost with the envelope and therefore the final orbit period might be orders of magnitude shorter than the initial period. So he says that this variable, uh, this uh, binary, could have formed through this channel. And finally, that detecting binary stars inside of a planetary nebula would provide very important support for this evol evolutionary scenario. So he's suggesting that when one of the stars expands, the, the other stars spirals in and the envelope is shed. So he mentions the Lagrange points. So what are these Lagrange points? So we know in a two body system, where this, uh, the, the yellow is a more massive uh, star, or for example, in our case, the sun, and the blue is the earth or the less ma least massive star. Uh, there are several uh, points of potential where the gravi gravitational pull from these stars kind of equals. So what we see is that, for example, imagine this is a well, and the well fills up with water or with gas. So imagine when this yellow star fills up with gas, where this uh, water will go next? Well, it will go into its companion because L1 is kind of the lowest of these points. So then the gas will be transferred from one, one star to another. But when both wells fill up with water, where is the next point to go? And this point is L2, which will be important later in the talk. So these are the, the Lagrange points. So this is the binary evolution timeline. As I mentioned, we see a population of binaries with long periods of days to years. And we also see in the other hand, very compact binaries with periods of minutes. So how do we explain this common envelope phase? So for um, quite a few years, um, this was a theoretical uh, challenge that, you know, people just say, well, then a miracle occurs. We call it the common envelope. We give it a sub prescription and then we turn the knobs of this prescription of these three parameters until we match kind of the, the population uh, of uh, compact binaries that we observe. But what exactly is happening there? That's what we want to know. So with uh, years of research, we actually agreed that there are several phases that this common envelope stage in, in binary takes. So initially, uh, during like several years, the, the one of the stars is transferring mass into the other. So this contact binary forms, but eventually something happens that triggers that this gas, uh, this envelope that you see, which is formed around the two stars, stops rotating with the binary. So initially it's rotating with the binary, they're transferring mass, and this is a contact binary which can survive for millions of years. But then something happens that this layer of gas, this common envelope, St stops rotating with the binary. So then what happens is that the secondary star starts to spiral into the primary. And when it starts spiraling into the primary, they're kind of both orbiting each other inside of this common envelope. So what happens is when you switch on the blender on a very high speed, kind of all the smoothie kind of goes around the, 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 the kind of the walls of the, of the blender. So this is exactly what's happening. These two cores orbiting inside of this gas, what are clearing kind of the space around them and they're pushing this envelope out. So this envelope then can basically be expanding for centuries and millennia 
until the, this gas is being dissolved into the interstellar medium. So after that, what we have is one of the stars and the naked core uh, of, the, of the couple. So this uh, problem has been uh, studied, uh, not only theoretically, but also using simulations. And this is one of the examples of what uh, we think may happen when one of the star reaches the, the outer edge of the envelope of the primary. So in this case, these uh, large stars is a red supergiant of two solar masses. And the companion, which is hard to see, which is like right on the border uh, of, of the envelope of the primary. And I will start a simulation and you will see how one of the stars will in spiral and there is lots of instability. So in this simulation, only 8% of this envelope is ejected. So here you see that one of the stars start to spiral, it spiral faster and faster and faster, and there is a large uh, ejecta of, of this gas. So these are all simulations, but we really do need uh, observations to constrain to some of these uh, simulations or, or theories. So I would like to start with simulations of stellar mergers, and actually the first one was also done uh, in, in Palomar. So uh, it actually was uh, in this uh, paper in 1989 by Michael Rich. So they were doing a survey of the uh, red supergiants in M31, and by chance, they noticed that there was a new star. It, that star looked the same brightness as the stars they were uh, studying, but it was not in their catalogs. So they were really puzzled. They took a spectrum and it looked uh, really like a red star, like indeed the red supergiant, uh, which was like fairly bright, more brighter than a nova, but they, they didn't know what that was. So they call it red variable and kind of they moved on. There were like some theories, but that was the, the first example of how a stellar merger may look like. Actually, the one of the, the next examples is, is this one. I think you're familiar with this VA3 Edmond image which is a really beautiful uh, Hubble image. So if we play this um, animated gift, what we see is the light echo. So the nova is this red uh, object in the middle. And what we see expanding is basically it's the reflection of the light of the nova in the surrounding gas. So this was like really amazing, but it was not until, uh, yeah, so sorry, here we see the, the three peaks. So the, the nova was a very unusual. It's not a normal nova. It had like three peaks. And basically the red uh, colors, as you can see here, were much brighter than the blue ones. So indeed it was a red nova. So it was not until 2007 in this paper of Sri um, that actually the, the term luminous red nova was coined. So this was another object discovered in the galaxy M85. And when uh, it was detected also by the uh, PTF survey. So when they looked uh, at, this, uh, at this object, it also looked very red. So they were again puzzled because uh, as you can see this uh, wavelength in the shorter wavelengths, there was like barely any flux. But in the longer wavelengths, like there was some flux. So this object was very red. So Sri uh, called it a luminous red nova because it was also more luminous than the normal nova population. So in this uh, diagram, what we see on the x-axis is how long it takes for this uh, transient to decay. And on the y-axis, we see the absolute uh, brightness of the how bright the, the transient was. And the color of the dot indicates whether it was uh, kind of blue uh, in, in between or it was red. So we see that this M85OT was the third example of this luminous red nova, which was in the gap between the conventional novae and supernova. So here is where the term was born. But the most impressive discovery was a few years later of this uh, object V1309 skull. So this object was towards the galactic bulge. So it was studied by the Ogle survey, which was targeting the, the galactic bulge in, to study microlensing. So for many, many years, we see that this object was observed uh, until the outburst happened in 2008. So what the authors of this paper did is they not only looked at the outburst, but they looked what happened before. 
And what they saw is that there was like kind of a lot of scatter in the light curve. It became brighter, but it had a lot of scatter. So they said, what if we tried to kind of fold this light curve and we can try to find a period? And they did. Indeed, they, they looked at every year and they tried to compute a period uh, for this light curve for every single year. And they saw that it was actually an eclipsing binary. So when one of the components came in front of the, of the other, we had like a dip in the light curve. So that's what exactly they saw. And not only that, what was the most impressive is that every year the period became shorter. So in this lower uh, plot, what we see is like the period became exponentially shorter until the final outburst happened. So after the outburst, they actually checked uh, this, this object and they didn't see a period anymore. So this was the first example that an object like that, which also looked like a, a luminous red nova, uh, spectroscopically, was having a, like a binary origin. So the binary merged and gave uh, birth to one of these uh, beautiful lu luminous red nova. We haven't witnessed uh, any more uh, eclipsing binary becoming novi, but this was kind of a Rosetta Stone to understand the nature of these transients. So here I'm going to present two more objects. Uh, in this case, these objects are in external galaxies. So these are also discoveries by the IPTF survey in 2013 and 2015. So one is in the M101 galaxy, and the other one is in the in Andromeda, in M31. So this is the second uh, luminous red nova in the same galaxy. So the good uh, thing of uh, studying luminous red nova in outer galaxies is that uh, if they're nearby, then they're extensively covered by, for example, uh, the Hubble uh, uh, archive, for example, or we have data from other surveys, such as like PANSTARS, for example, or CFHT. So after we witness the nova, we can say what was there before. So we can go to archival data and we can search what exactly was there. So we can study, for example, what was the, the color of the source or like the temperature and what's the, the luminosity of the source as well because we know the distance to that galaxy. So then we can study the characteristics of the progenitor stars. So in this case, we like to use the HR diagram, I guess you are familiar with, so we have the the main sequence where stars are born with different masses, but not only that, we also have um, theoretical models which can tell us exactly how a star of a given mass evolves. So in this case, in this case, um, a star similar to, to the sun, we know that it will, uh, it will leave the main sequence and it will start creeping over the red giant branch until it ignites uh, helium in the core. Then it will uh, contract a bit, but then it will become a planetary nebula which will die as a white dwarf. So knowing the, the stellar tracks, if we know here the, um, in the x-axis, what is the temperature of our progenitor stars and what is the luminosity, we can actually find what is the mass of the progenitor. And this is what we did with uh, M101. So we observed the object uh, 10 years uh, before the outburst. It was in archival data. We saw its discovery and then we made sure that the star was gone and that's what happened. So in like after two years, after the outburst, we observed the same field and there was no sign of that star. So it, it disappeared. So indeed um, it was not a chance alignment, that star was the progenitor. So we played this game. We used stellar evolution uh, tracks for like 17, 18, 19 and 20 solar masses. Uh, and we placed uh, the measurements of our progenitor star in this track. So we see the main sequence is here and the red giant branch. And these stars are kind of in between. They are in the gap between the main sequence and red, the red giant. So this is called the Hertzsprung gap. And stars are very unlikely to be found in that position because of their fast transition. So this, uh, this arrow here indicates how long it takes for a star of that mass to go uh, in the length of this arrow. So it's only 3000 years. So we think that those stars live like for millions of years in the main sequence, 3000 years, it's very, very short time in, in the life of that star. But this is kind of also makes sense because uh, when the star leaves the main sequence and it's still not burning uh, helium in its core, the, the star is in a really, really fast expansion. 
So it's in this phase that if the star had a companion, which is like at a closer distance, it would likely engulf the companion and start transferring mass such a high rate that this common envelope would form. So we also saw the similar case in the progenitor of the M31 luminous red nova. There was a archival HST data about 10 years before the nova event. And then we followed up the event with uh, Keck adaptative optics because it's a really crowded field in the Andromeda galaxy. And about 3.5 years, it was gone. So this is the K-band, this is infrared. So it was even gone in the infrared. So we didn't see that star anymore. And if we place the progenitor uh, star in the same diagram, we also see that it corresponds again, a star in the gap. So it also star which left the main sequence, but it's still not yet become a, a red, uh, red giant. So that was like also another uh, confirmation that these uh, luminous red nova are in this fast uh, mass transfer uh, scenario case. So here we see uh, the light curve and uh, our archival observations go up to 15 years before the outburst. So we see that initially uh, it's, it looks flat. So the, the light curve doesn't change much. So the, basically the system was more or less stable and we saw the progenitor. But up to five years before the outburst, we saw a very steady increase in the luminosity of this source. And finally the, the, the survey, the PTF survey detected this outburst like one and two peaks. So this peak was, was a bit bluer and this second peak was more red in colors. So we followed it up. And again, the, this, this uh, data points, the pink and, and cyan, they are from uh, Spitzer, the mid infrared emission. And these other uh, triangles, they correspond to uh, infrared emission, but all these other colored uh, points, they're optical. So the, the source was gone. It stayed a bit brighter in the infrared, but then it was really gone from the optical. From the other NOVA, we, we saw exactly the same. We saw the progenitor and we saw a steady brightening up to like about two years before the outburst. Here you have like the close up of the, of the peaks. Again, like the first peak, which was more blue and the second peak, uh, or which is more likely a, a plateau. So that was like redder and then it disappeared from the optical, but it stayed bright again in the infrared colors. So we also followed it up until later times to see what's, what's going on. So again, this precursor emission, this brightening was also observed in the galactic uh, merger, the V1309 scope. So in this theoretical work, um, Peihai and collaborators, what they tried to model is the shape of these eclipses and how they could change if the binary would start losing mass from that L2 point that I mentioned before. So if I play their simulation, what we can see is that here on top, you have how much mass per year in solar masses this system is losing. And when the system starts to lose a substantial amount of mass, it starts to form this kind of trail which starts to obscure one of the binary components. So this kind of sinusoidal uh, eclipses rather become a single hump eclipses because one of the components is being uh, obscured by this, um, this stream of mass. So this stream of mass can also be responsible in kind of stealing the angular momentum from the binary. So then the spiral happens much, much faster. So what we see is also this mass loss from this L2 when it kind of wraps around the binary and also it shocks uh, with you know, previous uh, e ejected uh, trails. So actually this uh, increases the temperature in the emission and it makes this kind of torus to kind of shine a bit more. So this would uh, explain this precursor emission that we saw in all these luminous red nova. So what happens with this gas? So what is the geometry of this, of this mass? So here we have two plots. The first one corresponds to what this uh, mass lost looks like. So the, the purple colors indicate that the gas is bound to the binary and the, this brown color indicates it's unbound. 
So when this gas is being lost from this L2, what we see that there is a, a torus which kind of sits around this binary and there is some outflowing gas from the poles. But when we become, when we reach this critical stage, when the secondary curves kind of in the, in the envelope of the primary star, which we saw in the simulation before, this mass is ejected from the binary. But what happens? We have the torus. So the mass cannot fully escape in a spherical shell from the binary, but rather it shocks this torus and it finds its way through the poles. So we have this kind of hourglass uh, shape because this, uh, for example, these red colors indicate that the mass is unbound and the blue indicates it's bound. So this torus prevents from this spherical mass ejection to expand and it rather kind of funnels it into this uh, polar uh, ejection. So that's what the uh, simulation has shown us. And here you have like a summary cartoon. So when we see a light curve of this um, luminous red nova, what do we actually see? So first we see the, the precursor emission, which is the formation of this, uh, of this uh, disk. Then we see the blue peak, which corresponds to the cooling emission from the mass which has been ejected through the poles. And then we normally see the red peak and the red peak corresponds to this fast blue ejecta actually crashing into this torus and shocking. And these shocks also release some of the emission, which uh, it's, it's, it's represented into the red peak. And finally, when the whole system kind of expands, we expect it to, to form dust. And why do I say that? Well, when we followed up, this object in uh, M31, this luminous red nova, I mentioned that it's uh, um, in the optical, it, it just disappeared really, really fast in just a few months. But then this data, the, the pink and the, the cyan measurements, they show Spitzer measurements in the mid infrared and the object was still bright in the mid infrared indicating that there were some kind of a warm dust in the system. So if we try to reproduce uh, our, uh, well, the, the observations and bring it into how the uh, emission looked like, we see that at early times, the temperature of the dust was about like 1,700 Kelvin, but uh, about the three years and a half after the outburst, the dust cooled up to 700 Kelvin only. So that means that the dust cooled dramatically during like a, just, just a few years. So this dust likely just expanded and cooled and expanded and cooled. And what we see in the, for example, in galactic objects, if we follow them up, is that indeed a very cold gas and dust forms. So this is another example of a, a luminous red nova that outbursted about 24 years ago, and it was observed with ALMA. So um, ALMA observes in like a millimeter. So this is a, a transition in the, CO, which actually traces gas, which is like 10 to 100 Kelvin. So it's a very cold uh, gas. So they observed uh, this luminous red nova, which actually outbursted in our own galaxy. So as it's so nearby, the emission actually could be resolved with, with ALMA. So what they saw is that gas, which moves uh, more than 130 kilometers per second, was not in a kind of a spherical um, configuration, but rather it had these kind of two lobes or components. So when this uh, group uh, tried to model this emission and to reproduce how the uh, kind of the ejector looked like, they came up with this model, which kind of looks like an hourglass structure that the simulations uh, forecasted before. So what we see is that the gas is moving really fast from the poles, but there is no, um, uh, there is no, no gas outflowing from the kind of the, the belt of the system. So then what happens not like 24 years, but later on when this system expands even more. So what we do see is that the sea systems form what we know as planetary nebula. So initially planetary nebula were thought to be formed from AGB stars that would shed their, their like outer envelopes and just expand. But we find that there are many, many planetary nebula which are not spherically symmetric. They have this hourglass structure. 
And this is very hard to explain with a single star scenario. So if you see the model that I showed before for this luminous red nova, we see that it, it kind of matches the, the shape that we see for this planetary nebula. And in the center, uh, there have been several studies. What we see is it, it has a system of two white dwarfs. So there are two degenerate stars. Uh, their masses is uh, slightly less than the sun, so 0.9 uh, solar masses, and their period is only four hours. So when these two white dwarfs, they're actually emitting gravitational waves as they spiral around each other. So after many, many years, when gravitational wave make them collide, they actually will make a type 1a supernova explosion. So these are one of the most massive candidates for a to be progenitor of uh, this kind of explosion. So yeah, Paczynski said, if we see a planetary nebula with a short period binary in the core, that would be an ultimate proof of this common envelope scenario. And we, we see that. So um, a large fraction of planetary nebula actually host binary stars. And there are some cases and they have single stars and those single stars have peculiar properties. So we also can imagine that Maybe it's not like the two stars managed to uh, kind of shed all the, of their envelope, but they ended up in a, in a merger surrounded by, by the envelope. So this uh, miracle happens situation over the years is actually clearing a bit. So we see the population of stars. We can actually, in some of these cases, we can even uh, study them with, with archival data. Then we know that this mass transfer happens. And in this case, uh, this simulation show us it's likely happens when this L2 point is when mass starts to flow from there and still the angular momentum of the system. Then we see outbursts such as the, this, this one of the M31 luminous red nova. We have these two peaks, we have the, the torus. So that's why we have it. And then over the centuries, the, the, this gas expands leading to these uh, very peculiar um, uh, well, shapes for planetary nebula. And after, again, we see the population of compact binary stars. So observations helped us to kind of clear up uh, the fog into, into this. So what now? So stellar mergers uh, have been uh, discovered with Palomar. So here on this plot, you have the, the Again, the, the parameter space of, uh, of different transients, the decay the time scale on the x-axis and the absolute magnitude. So these uh, black dots are the luminous red novae that we knew uh, or that were not discovered by PTF. Or, and here we have like the population nearly doubled thanks to discoveries made by IPTF, PTF, and also ZTF. So ZTF, as, as you may know, has a much larger camera than its, its predecessor. So it's, it, it has been delivering just like an amazing results uh, over like different uh, aspects of, of, yeah, not only transient astronomy, but also variable and uh, solar system. But we discover also many uh, luminous red nova that are being studied now. And we also look forward to our uh, ZTF2 to, to make actually a population um, studies for this luminous red nova and compute the rates in the nearby universe. So here I would like to uh, conclude. And uh, the conclusion is uh, we yet do not understand enough about binary evolution, but luminous uh, red novae are powerful probes that allow us to kind of witness in real time this common envelope ejection phase in binary system. We have seen that uh, several of the progenitors seem to be these uh, evolved stars which are leaving the main sequence, which kind of agrees with this mass transfer scenario. Then the mass loss is critical to initiate the spiraling, especially when it happens from this L2 point. After the system has ejected the, the envelope, dust and molecules form, and this likely forms this planetary nebula. So these luminous red novae, especially the old ones, they become a very strong link to kind of uh, put together the populations before and after.
So I would like to conclude here and say that um, thank you very much for inviting me. And I will take any questions. Dr. Nadia Blagorinova, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Please, let's, let's open the floor for questions. Well, I'd like to ask about the diagram in your previous slide, slide 29. There's that diagram of the time scale versus the brightness uh, that shows the luminous for LBVs, all that. That's really an incredibly informative diagram. So is there, is that in one of your papers? Is there a source for that? Or oh, well, this is, um... This diagram was proposed by, by Sri, but uh, Mansi Kasliwell, uh, her PhD thesis, mm -hmm. that's the ultimate uh, source for, for this diagram. Yeah, if you, um, I guess you can just Google like a parameter space, transient parameter space. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right now uh, ZTF is actually filling up, you know, these boxes, I mean, these are just boxes, mm -hmm. but what ZTF is doing right now is actually provide a lot of objects. So, you know, these, these are not becoming boxes anymore. These are becoming clouds, you know, of, <laughs> yeah. of points that belongs to like real supernovae and real transients. It's like an HR diagram and it really would be nice to see something like that filled out. It's incredibly informative. Yeah, no, now the ZTF also will start like the ZTF2 at two night cadence. So actually the object in like the left part, which are like the faster transients, mm -hmm. uh, they will become, uh, you know, more populated because those are very hard to catch because they just disappear overnight. Mm -hmm. Other questions, other questions? Um, a little bit off the topic, a little bit tangential to the topic, but um, Nadia, do you know, there's, there was a, a while ago, the star Betelgeuse was, was fading out and then finally grew brighter again. Was there ever a, a good determination of what caused that? Yeah. Yes. So... Actually, this week we had a colloquium uh, here at Radboat of, uh, by Meredith uh, Joyce. Uh, so she is uh, modeling uh, pulsations of stars. So she and her collaborators, they studied the, you know, the variability of Betelgeuse over like many, many, many years. So they could actually determine like um, from the pulsations, the, the likely mass of the star and the radius of the star. And uh, they wanted to see whether the dimming would correspond to one of the pulsations or whether it was kind of predicted by the model. But uh, yeah, what they saw is it was likely just some dust, you know? So yeah, then the kind of the star recovered and stuff. So. Yeah, according to their models, it was just uh, obscuration by some of the dust in the in the stars. So it was not uh, related to the evolution of the star. It was just some kind of you know mass ejection or something that like just created some dusty um, curtain that obscured the star, so we couldn't see it. But yeah, the star was was okay. So it's, there is no no danger because not yet. Many times, so. Well, yes, it, it is a great relief to know that Betelgeuse is okay. <laughs> I'd rather see it blow up. Come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, just yeah. take your time. Take your, it, it, it'll, happen. it'll happen. In in your conclusion slides, I'm trying to remember all the letter acronyms that you displayed. Uh, L, oh, yeah. L, uh, L yeah. R. Okay, so L R. Yeah, common envelope, luminous red novi, and planetary nebula. Sorry. Planetary nebula. P N. Okay, thank you. Okay, so jungle being here. Okay, thank you. I do have one question. Yeah. And that is, are you saying that when it comes to binaries and when they merge, they don't really be, merge into one star; they stay binaries? 
Well, no, no, the, the, there are two different scenarios. So imagine if they manage to clear all the gas, right. they shed the gas and the binary shrinks and it survives as a binary. But if there are so much gas and the gas is like not really puffy, right? And it's really tied to one of the stars, mm -hmm. the second star will keep in spiraling, keep in spiraling. So, you know, like, it's like the blender it doesn't have enough power to you know clear all the smoothie <laughs> in your glass. So basically the, the pair will crash. So part of this envelope will fly away, but some like mostly of the envelope will just shrink around that uh, binary that will merge. So there are two different outcomes of this uh, binary evolution scenario. They can either merge or become a complex binary. Oh, so both scenarios could happen. Yeah. Uh, but if, if they maintain uh, a, to be a binary, I guess they would start orbiting each other very, very closely, correct? Yeah, yeah. And here is where all this gravitational wave emission becomes important <sighs> to further shrink the binary and then the binary will merge. Okay, thank you. I have a, okay, oh, go ahead, Ken. I'll go ahead. Is it fair to say that most of the planetaries that we amateurs like to observe and image, the Messiers and the NGCs and so forth, are produced by uh, red giant uh, uh, collapse rather than this binary star merger? Generally, it depends on the... Uh, or there's geometry you know like if they're like more spherical they are likely coming from single stars that you know expanded so much that you know they actually shed their envelopes uh but in all the well not all the but normally i would say that if if it's very asymmetrical right and they have these kind of funny jets or like you know hourglass structure likely those planetary nebula come from binaries because it's very hard to say how a single star would shed mass in this kind of funnel structure, but the binary scenario explains it so well. And then also several surveys are actually targeting the course of planetary nebula, trying to find what fraction uh, actually it's a binary. So I think about 20% uh, were found to be binaries, but those methods required eclipses or kind of modulations in the light curve. So if your binary is just orbiting like, you know, in this kind of plane, then you won't really see it as a, as a binary, so. So something like the familiar dumbbell could be an instance of this. Yeah, I don't have it right in my mind, but. Uh, M27. It's basically a double lobe structure, so it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. Pro probably there is a paper about the the central the central components. Okay. I'll have to look that up. Thank you. Nadia, going back to Beetlejuice, I think it was recently reported that it's dimmer and closer than than what was previously believed. Uh, can you explain how that was, uh, how they arrived at that? Uh, yes. So that that was the the paper that I I mentioned before. So using the pulsations, right? They yeah, they look like several many many decades of uh, photometry of Betelgeuse. So they found the the period of of that star and the amplitude of of the pulsations. So the team has developed uh, stellar evolution models, which tells you what kind of pulsations different stars for different masses have. So they uh, kind of compared their models with the observations of Betelgeuse. Uh, so they could constrain uh, what was the initial mass of that star and what was the radius so that the pulsations could match the observations. And uh, yeah, I think they, yeah, they reached uh, to the conclusion that the radius, I think, was uh, smaller, right, than they thought. So it had to be closer 
to yes. appear bright as, as it is. So, so the key thing is that they had a better estimate of the radius, which let them uh, led them to those conclusions. Yeah, yeah, because I think previously people used like interferometric techniques to measure the, the radius, but apparently the interferometry and the modeling, they do not totally agree with each other because it really depends on what do you find as a photosphere of a star, right? So the, yeah, like it, it's a hard definition to, to say. So maybe what you observe is not the real photosphere. The photosphere is like a bit, inside because it depends on the wavelength that you um, use to do the observations. Thank you. Yeah. That, that's covered in the paper by Meredith Joyce and her team that's on the archive preprint right. server. Uh, yeah. They put it up October 15th, so it's fairly new. Yeah, I, it's very, very recent, yeah. <laughs> no, but that was like, Really cool, like, yeah, she gave a colloquium uh, just this week. So, you know, it was like really nice to see how yeah. they could use the pulsations, you know, to infer the characteristic of, of the star. What I found most interesting about that is there's a plot in the paper that compares their distance with other parallax distance methods. And they all kind of clump together. They're estimate from their modeled size of the star falls right in the middle of the distribution of parallax distances. So it's not insane. It, who knows whether it's right or not, because it's almost impossible to get that right. But it's right in the middle of the distribution. So the fact that they did it backwards looking at the stellar model instead of a parallax angle and still got something that compares strikes me as being Pretty damn yeah. interesting, actually. Well, that tells you that you understand stellar evolution, at least. <laughs> or... yeah. Other questions? Other comments? Ken, well, let me. Let, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Who's next? next? Yeah, so right, right in the beginning of your presentation, I was trying to understand what percentage of stars are binaries or what? Here, this one. Yeah. So. That's also a very informative plot. Mm. So yeah, no, this, this is like an amazing great. work because this is the ultimate proof. So in this paper, they, um, studied, uh, you know, binary stars detected through different techniques, uh, you know, by eclipsing, by uh, just direct imaging, and they try to correct all the biases that these techniques had. And this, what is informed is like, what fraction of those stars actually uh, mm -hmm. had a companion. But of course, like here, if you read the small, uh, you know, font, Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's between a certain value of periods, so they could not go to very short or very long periods, for example, because, you know, if you have a period of like several, like, you know, tens of years, then it's, it's really hard to, to measure, or for like certain mass uh, ratios, for mass ratios, which are like very small when one of the companions is very tiny, for example, the radio velocity techniques is very hard to, to apply. So then uh, they also did not uh, account for that. But yeah, in general, you know, uh, you see like a very nice trend that the fraction of stars with companions increases a lot and, when you go to uh, more massive stars. And is one the absolute maximum? No, it could be. I'm, I'm trying to follow the, the y-axis, a fraction, uh, it, right? It's a, yeah, it's just a fraction, like 20% uh, of like stars with one solar mass have a companion. Okay. Okay. And uh, I don't know, like 10, it was like 80% have a companion. And if it's like 30 solar masses, it's like 100%? Yeah, or even more if yeah, it's like, you know, 110%. So yeah, that's what I mentioned, that those are likely having triples. Oh, OK. Hmm. Wow, thank, thank you. I mean, th this is a really nice plot, because really, it, it tells us we should 
think in binaries where we think about how the universe evolved, right? Like uh, the more massive stars are the ones that are also making all these uh, supernova and gravitational waves and lots of like really fancy transients that we love to study, you know, with uh, like ZTF or PTF and other surveys. So like this diagram tells us like more likely everything that is, you know, it's a fancy explosion will come from a binary origin. Yeah, so it was a long, long time ago, I heard someone say that more than half the stars are binaries of, in, in the sky, but I, but this is a very impressive diagram. So. Yeah, it really depends on the mass. Yes, yes. I think the idea that most stars are binary comes from the old surveys like by Helmut App because he was magnitude limited and he can only see brighter stars, which you can see from this plot are mm. or be binary. But I've seen more recent papers that, are, that can dig down to dimmer magnitudes and see the lower mass stars. And they come to the conclusion that really probably not half, less than half are mm. binaries. And a plot like this really shows what you're looking at. If you're magnitude limited, you're going to think everything's a binary because you can only see the brighter stars. Yeah, yeah, no. It's good. It's good. Another shade of, 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 of information, more, more detail, which is good. On another tack, I'll do a quick reminiscence because I remember one time up at Palomar Observatory, we had a group of Caltech astronomy students and you were either the 200 inch observer or you were up there working on uh, IPTF or ZTF. I'm not sure what capacity, but you were incredibly gracious with those students. You took time to talk to them, you know, talked about Caltech, talked about their careers and so forth. And, you know, I was very impressed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, as, a, as an anecdote, I remember being at the observing at the 200 inch and then receiving a call from, uh, you know, a professor in India who was having a, an interview like live with Sri from, from Palomar. And he was asking like, oh, do you know where Sri is? It's like, well, no, I don't know where he is. It's like, well, he has to connect live with, with us, you know, for like, uh, you know, um, here, like the Indian TV to explain, like, uh, you know, the observations and stuff. And uh, we had no clue because probably they mixed up the, the time zones, right? Mm -hmm. So fortunately it was like with, uh, you know, some uh, students and postdocs we, which belong to this, uh, the same program, the growth program that, uh, you know, that Mansi is leading. So we were actually doing science for the growth uh, program. So then we connected with them and we just explained what kind of science we were doing. And you know, that kind of really saved the situation. <laughs> and that's really funny. Now we had lots of fun. What, what, kind, of, what kind of telescopes, what, what, what equipment, what instruments, um, are you using now from, from where you are in the Netherlands? Right, so from the Netherlands, I can apply for time at the ESO telescopes. And then also there is a consortium um, called Opticon that uh, gives you access to kind of like uh, many small telescopes across uh, Europe and also Chile. For example, the LCO uh, group is also part of Opticon. So being at, uh, yeah, you can submit uh, proposals to observe with these telescopes. Uh, some of my collaborators had also time at GTC. So that's kind of the largest, uh, the Grand Tecan in Canary Islands. That's a uh, 10.4 uh, meters. So that's kind of the largest uh, telescope I have been observing right now. I mean, I miss, I miss uh, Keck, to be honest. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, well, we're, we're, we're running about an hour here and let me, let me make, make one more call for, uh, call for questions. Is there anything anybody wants to, uh, wants to bring up? 
Well, with that, let me thank Dr. Nadia Gagordanova. Wonderful presentation, taking the time out to speak to us today. Thank In you. two weeks, Dr. Luisa Rebull will talk about the infrared universe and what we have learned from the data gathered by the Spitzer telescope. That's two weeks from now, whatever the date is. And I want to thank everybody for coming. And thank you very much. That's it. Great we'll presentation. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Okay. See you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Ciao. Do the election. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. No, no, no. I should have gone there. I should have done that. That didn't happen. Okay. Yeah. See you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Thank